Daily news and analysis. We keep you informed and inspired. This is World Today. Hello and welcome to World Today. I'm Ding Han in Beijing. Coming up, China has allowed citizens of four more European countries to travel to China visa-free. Israel launches ground raids against the Hezbollah. In the second half, we will bring you to a conversation between CGTN Radio and Executive Chairman of the America-China Partnership Foundation. To listen to this episode again or to catch up on previous episodes, you can download our podcast by searching "World Today." China has granted citizens of four more European countries visa waivers. Tourists from Portugal, Greece, Cyprus, and Slovenia are now allowed to enter China for short stays without a visa until the end of next year, bringing the total number of European countries up to 17. Norway and Denmark were also added to this list recently. China has announced a visa-free scheme in stages since November 2023, aiming to encourage more people to visit China for business and tourism. Data from online travel agency Trip.com showed a 663% increase in overall bookings from Europe to China last year compared to 2022, and an almost 29% increase from 2019. Apart from the 17 countries, Malaysia, Australia, and New Zealand have gained access to the scheme. So joining us now on the line is Mike Bastian, China Observer and a Senior Lecturer with the University of Southampton. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Mike Bastian. First of all, why do you think China is happy to encourage people in Europe to travel to China? I think the, the obvious、uh, short-term benefit is、yeah, an economic boost, obviously、uh, tourism, travel, the hospitality sector, but also a full range of business. Sectors, so it, it needs to be noted that the, this visa-free policy is to do with business、um, travel as well, not just tourism. So, so in the short term, it's those economic benefits. But in the longer term, it's also about broadening、uh, the integration of the Chinese economy and strengthening international relations globally as well. So, I think there's a full range of short and long-term benefits. Hmm. So, according to、um, Trip.com's、um, findings. Uh, Shanghai remains the most popular destination in China among Europeans, followed by Beijing, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen. These are、uh, some of the traditional、uh, first-tier cities here in this country.、Yeah. In the meantime, Sanya, which is a beachside city on the southern end of the、um, Hainan province or the Hainan Island in China, as well as Chengdu, namely the capital city of the southwestern Chinese province of Sichuan, are emerging destinations among European travelers. What do you make of this、um, this finding? It's not a surprise that the first tier cities have received a lot of publicity. Obviously, the capital city in Beijing is, is so rich in, in in history and heritage, and Shanghai is perhaps the most international city as well,、uh, with, with trading links and, and the other two first two tier cities. So I think that that's not a surprise.、Uh, it's very encouraging to see Sanya and the the sort of beach holiday resort、uh, of Hainan、uh, gaining more. Attraction and also Chengdu, Southwest China, noted for for spicy food and pandas.、Mm-hmm. Uh, I think what's also interesting here is though, that we should see a spread in in the the tourism travel. I think it's such a rich history and heritage that China has over five thousand years, as we know, that covers you know, right across mainland China. So I think this this list will grow, and I think the relative importance of these. Typically, these first-tier cities will decline, and we'll see northwest China, northeast China, also gain、uh, appeal as well. So, you know, we're just scratching the surface, I think, in terms of tourism and travel opportunities that, that the international tourists will value across China. Hmm. So, by the way, Mike,、um, based on your、um, personal expertise about China, is there any particular、uh, city or region in China that you might、uh, recommend to、uh, to people from Europe? I think there's quite a few. It's such a it's such a fascinating area that has rich history. So, so if we look at, for example, Shandong Province, and we look at the 
the, the Confucius and Confucius' hometown of Chufu, which was a, a must visit for me many years ago, mm. many, many years ago. So it's a Shandong province rich in history. And uh, we've also got Northeast China and, and again, very, very rich cultural heritage uh, bordering Russia and the sort of influence there. And then you go to Northwest China as well. So uh, I think you know, Shandong province in particular, but, 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 but many areas. And I think the international tourist will will begin to appreciate these. Perhaps you know, the Chinese government should really take this opportunity uh, more, promote this more. Mm. So in what kind of areas do you think China could do a better job in terms of, say, creating a more friendly, uh, a more convenient environment for, for, for travelers from Europe? I mean, quite a few. First of all, let's, let's just highlight the fact that this, this policy is, is working. It's very successful. According to the Xinhua News Agency, we're seeing in the first nine months of this year, 55.4% year-on-year increase in inbound tourists to China, estimated 95 million. Uh, so it is working. The Chinese government have also mandated tourist attractions to accept a range of payment methods now, bank cards, QR codes, cash, again, to help foreign tourists. But again, coming back to my previous point, I think what they could do more is promote um, the full range or full, full uh, areas across China, so Shandong province, northeast China, northwest China, where there are very strong regional cultures and histories and heritage, and that will appeal to the international tourist who perhaps at the moment is not that conversed and not that familiar with some of these, and perhaps simply does think of Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, maybe going a little bit further to Sichuan and, and Tanya, but there's so much more. So, so really promoting uh, regional culture across China uh, and, and continuing with the visa-free policy and encouraging the service sector to be um, uh, to develop, develop that infrastructure, develop uh, customer relations and allow payment methods more easily. Yeah, more of the same and a bit more. Mm. So um, the other way around, when we talk about uh, Chinese uh, citizens traveling to European countries, um, in most cases, I guess, um, Schengen visa application are a must procedure. And actually, many people here in China have complained about the perceived um, bureaucratic hassles involved during this application process. Now that China has granted visa-free travel opportunities to citizens from uh, 17 European countries, uh, based on a spirit of um, reciprocity, uh, for example, do you think European countries or, or the EU, for that matter, should also think about how to make it easier for Chinese citizens to travel to European countries? I do. I think it's a very, very important point, and it's a, it's a vital uh, component, vital input to the European economy as well. Chinese tourists, you know, Chinese university students, I'm very familiar with this sector, uh, and, and I'm also familiar with the complaints and the bureaucracy they go through. So I think uh, reciprocity should dictate, and also economic interest should dictate that the EU and, and, and other European countries could do far more to make it far easier for Chinese tourists uh, Chinese visitors to travel across the European Union, which they absolutely adore. It's a real attraction for them to hop across so many European countries that for them are so close to to each other. Again, so much history as well. I mm. think uh, more should be done, and hopefully it will be done. Hopefully, again, like I said in the first question, the answer was that um, this is really an act of sort of uh, friendship, you know, holding out a sort of uh, mutual beneficial arrangements for, for, for the whole world economy, particularly Europe. So, yes, hopefully more will be done and should be done. The economic and social benefits are very real across Europe for Chinese Chinese tourists to contribute to. Yeah. Mm. So from an industry's uh, perspective, uh, Mike, um, how do you think China and Europe could um, deepen their cooperation in the tourism sector? I think more joint joint ventures, more collaboration uh, across particularly the tourism, the hospitality sector, where uh, famous brands, whether it's hotel chains, whether it's airlines, I think could work together more. I'm sure there are benefits there. Uh, so it's not just a case of encouraging tourists sort of coming in China and going out of China. So more joint ventures, more strategic partnerships, longer term co-branding was definitely in that sector and related sector. So hopefully this will encourage uh, closer cooperation across 
uh, not just tourism, travel, hospitality, but a range of business sectors. Again, the V2P policy allows for business travel as well, where longer-term relationships and partnerships are formed. And I think that's part of the, the longer-term benefit that this policy is all about as well, so closer business ties and longer-term cooperation uh, from which both you know, everybody uh, will benefit most definitely. Mm. Well, I guess that's, of course, a, a, a very beautiful picture that you have um, portrayed. But uh, in some particular industries, for example, high-tech or EV, currently there were some trade frictions between the two sides. On the part of the EU side, there seems to be an increasing sentiment about, say, trade protectionism against the Chinese businesses. Do you think this will be a potential problem in terms of the um, tourism cooperation between the two sides? I don't think so. I think the two will be detached. And I think that on the European side, they see them as, as quite detached. So, so I think on the tourism side, and, and this mm. is a huge sector, a huge related sectors, travel, hospitality generally, I don't think there are those concerns that there are uh, in the high-tech sector. So, so I think, fortunately, there'll be a detachment there. So I think we can, we can go ahead and accelerate in that area. Uh, and as I said before, I think this will allow for the European side to see that really China is an opportunity, it's not a threat, it's a potential for threats when it comes to high tech you know, security, for example, are, are really not there or exaggerated. And, and it, it really is something that requires dialogue, getting around the table and seeing that both sides are really trying to help each other. So again, on this, this visa-free policy and related policies, I think the European Side will will warm to this, will welcome this, and future uh, cooperation, negotiation across the high tech sectors will benefit as well. So I think mm. it's generally a far more positive move than it might seem short term, long term, and it will spread across other sectors, including high tech. Yeah, I take a point. The final question before we let you go, Mike. Um, frankly speaking, do you think the tourism sector could generate a positive impact on the relationship between China and Europe in a political or geopolitical sense? Most definitely. I mean, the tourism sector is a growth area. It's a huge sector, a huge part of the service sector. And as economies develop, as we know, as China is, it becomes more important. Manufacturing is still important, but relatively less important. But, but yes, I think with the Chinese uh, tourism and tour inbound tourists to China in particular, there's, there's such a wealth of history and heritage that it will create um, a very, very warm relationship, a very positive feeling and even more positive association with China and Chinese history and what China has to offer, that it will spill over into better international relations, uh, a better understanding of China and what China has to offer, uh, and again, that this is really an opportunity, uh, most definitely. So yes, I think Chinese history, Chinese heritage will open up the eyes of the, the sort of Western tourists far more to to the real China and, and all the benefits, international relations, etc. That will follow. So very, uh, very exciting, very exciting time. Mm, thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Mike Bastian, China Observer and a Senior Lecturer at the University of Southampton. Coming up, Israel launches ground raids against the Hezbollah. Stay tuned. You are listening to World Today. I'm Ding Han in Beijing. Israel has launched a ground operation in southern Lebanon, marking an escalation in its continuing offensive against the Hezbollah. Israel is describing the operation as limited, localized, and targeted ground raids aimed at Hezbollah's infrastructure. Hezbollah's deputy leader says the group is prepared for any Israeli operation inside Lebanon. Israel's operation comes a few days after Hezbollah's leader Hassan Nasrallah was killed by bunker-busting bombs in Beirut. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant has described last Friday's killing as a very important step, but not everything. So joining us now on the line is Dr. Zhang Chuchu, Deputy Director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Fudan University. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Zhang Chuchu. Uh, do you expect Israel's ground operation or ground raids to be limited, localized, or targeted? 
Uh, right. Actually, I expected that this would be ca the case because right now we can see that the main strategies of Israel's attack on Hezbollah in Lebanon at present include large-scale airstrikes, um, targeted killings of its key commanders, and also the destruction of key facilities such as communication and missile uh, missile launch bases. Um, so um, the objective is to undermine Hezbollah's combat uh, capabilities. So actually, Israel's focus is still uh, on Gaza. So it doesn't want to deploy a large number of troops and engage in close combat with Hezbollah's uh, militants deep into the Lebanese um, hinterland. So I would say that Israel has emphasized that it will launch um, limited ground operations. And the purpose is to establish a certain military presence in Lebanon at the moment through small-scale ground, uh, ground operations. Um, and it, see, it, 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 it perceives that Hezbollah is right now uh, probably uh, undergoing uh, internal disorganization and suffers from significant damage. And that, that is why Israel considers that um, this is its opportunity to um, present its own military presence in Lebanon. Okay. So another message we have heard from the Israeli side is that it is using all the means at its disposal to allow displaced people to return home in the north of the country after nearly a year of cross-border fighting. What is your take on this? Is this the fundamental motive for Israel's um, ground operations there? So from my own observation, I think um, Israel has two objectives uh, by um, saying so. So I think the first objective is that it wants to create a, an atmosphere of deterrence so as to let the Lebanese, especially the civilians, know that uh, there may have a war and it tries to um, prevent the civilians from joining the war. Uh, and also it uh, tries to drive more people out of uh, the southern part of Lebanon. Uh, well, and at the same time, actually, there is a second and more important objective, and that is Israel wants to um, so to differentiate um, Hezbollah from the other people in uh, in Lebanon. As we know, Lebanon has different sections, um, so mm. there is the problem of sectarian um, difference. And right now, Israel tries to um, to show to the world that its objective uh, is just to target Hezbollah instead of the other sections in Lebanon. Um, so at the moment, that is why it's saying that it will be a very limited operation. Uh, and also, it is trying to persuade the, Le the Lebanese government to negotiate with Israel on the political arrangements in southern um, Lebanon uh, after the war. Hmm. So Hezbollah is known to have extensive tunnel networks as well as, say, bunkers and other kinds of military infrastructure just over the border from Israel. It is also believed to have um, tens of thousands of well-trained fighters. So with that in mind, do you think Israel is, is capable of, say, crippling Hezbollah, if not eliminating Hezbollah? Uh, I would say that this is very difficult. Um, so Israel, actually Israel knows that it is not capable of eliminating Hezbollah because as we know, Hezbollah is much stronger uh, than Hamas in terms of the number of its troops as well as the number of its, mi uh, of its missiles and the other weapons. Uh, but uh, since the, uh, the eruption of the Palestine-Israel conflict till now, uh, we see that it has already been almost one year and Hamas is still there. Uh, Israel has not um, fulfilled its objective of eliminating Hamas. Uh, so, and it knows clearly that Hezbollah is a more difficult um, enemy for it. And also, I say that right now, Israel knows that uh, the conflict between Hezbollah and Israel is not the main focus and it's not the main uh, battlefield in this conflict. So right now, Israel's tactic is that it pursues limited objectives. Mm. Um, so, for instance, Israel has already um, said that uh, it hopes that its northern residents can return home safely. And also um, it tries to build a, a so-called security zone. And also uh, a more important purpose is to, um, to, to exert more pressure on Hezbollah uh, so as to let it promise not to continue supporting Hamas. Uh, but we, uh, we will find that these are also um, very difficult objectives for it to um, fulfill at the moment. But that is what Israel wants to achieve. 
uh, and also so that is why Israel is now trying to combine different strategies, um, both by launching uh, large scale airstrikes and also to launch its uh, ground operations. And also it is trying to divide uh, different sections in Lebanon in order to negotiate with the Lebanese government instead mm. of just uh, negotiating with Hezbollah. Mm, I take your point. Um, by the way, how big of a blow is this um, recent killing of Hassan Nasrallah dealing to Hezbollah? Okay, first of all, we should know that uh, according to Hezbollah's own organizational structure, uh, this armed group has its own mechanism of replacing different levels of commanders. Uh, so right now, uh, even though a lot of uh, very important and high level commanders have been killed uh, during the conflict, uh, Hezbollah has already uh, said and promised that it is going to um, replace them with new um, fighters. Uh, but uh, we should admit that Hassan uh, Nasrallah is a symbol, uh, not just for Hezbollah, but for many of the armed groups in the region, especially for the Shia armed groups. Uh, so right uh, the moment, so Israel's killing of uh, Hassan Nasrallah uh, is actually a a kind of like strategic deterrence for Hezbollah, uh, as well as its allies. So right now, I would say there is a big blow um, for Hezbollah um, because there is currently no leader at the moment. And also, it's not just uh, the killing of Hassan Nasrallah, but before that, um, we have seen that Hezbollah has also um, experienced a pager uh, explosion incident. Uh, which disrupted Hezbollah's communication system. And it means that Hezbollah um, cannot use its old way of communicating with each other and they should replace it with new systems, which is, mm. uh, of course, it takes it takes a long time to um, do all these replacements. So right yeah. now, um, there is a uh, really significant decline in Hezbollah's combat um, capability. Mm. So like you said earlier, the Gaza Strip remains to be the... Uh, the focal point for the Israeli side right now. So can we say that um, even though uh, the media attention or the public attention uh, seems to be uh, shifting a little bit to towards Israel's um, northern border with Lebanon and the fighting going on over there in that region, um, uh, but on the other hand, the uh, the room for Hamas, for example, to reorganize and uh, regroup in the Gaza Strip uh, will be limited. Uh, so first of all, I would say that uh, right now, although there is an escalation of conflict between um, Lebanon, Hezbollah and Israel, I would say that Israel still wants to maintain its military force in Gaza. Mm. Uh, it's not going to just uh, drive its troops out um, from Gaza and put them into um, Hezbollah. That is not its plan. Uh, so that is why Israel has emphasized that its ground operation in Lebanon will be limited. And at the same time, I'd say that uh, right now, Israel's operations uh, towards Lebanon actually serves to its purpose uh, in the Gaza war. Because till now, it has already been almost a year um, since the new round of conflict uh, in Gaza has started. And now Israel has already launched a lot of huge and large scale um, airstrikes in the place. And it has already damaged many critical facilities of Hamas. And also it has already killed many of its important commanders. And right now Israel knows that even if it's, um, you know, um, launched more attacks in Gaza, it's not going to achieve uh, its objectives of, such as eliminating Hamas, etc. So right now Israel uh, considers that uh, at the moment, in the short term, it's very hard for Hamas to continue its attacks. Uh, but if Israel uh, just withdraws, uh, it anticipates or it, it, or it expects that maybe uh, Hamas is going to reorganize itself. And that is uh, why Israel is afraid of um, this kind of scenario. So right now, Israel's um, purpose is to, um, is to stop any kind of external aid uh, to to help and support Hamas. So that is why it's trying to escalate its conflict um, with Lebanon and Hezbollah and it's going to conduct the strategic deterrence towards Hezbollah and Houthi rebels, etc. in order to prevent those allies from keep supporting Hamas. So in the end, the purpose is to marginalize Hamas. Mm, thank you very much for joining us. That was Dr. Zhang Chuchu, Deputy Director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Fudan University. 
You're listening to World Today. We'll be back after a short break. You're listening to World Today. I'm Ding Han in Beijing. From proposing the five principles of peaceful coexistence to championing a community with a shared future for mankind, China has transformed from an isolated nation in the early days of the People's Republic to a key player shaping international relations. What milestone events have had or are expected to have far-reaching implications in China's diplomatic history, and how may China's role continue to evolve in the international arena? In this episode of our special series commemorating 75 years of the PRC, my colleague Tu Yun sits down with Dr. John Milligan White, Executive Chairman of the America-China Partnership Foundation, for his insights. So, welcome to the chat, Dr. Milligan White. Thank you. Well, let's start with the general evaluation of China's、um, trajectory. Of China's、um, diplomacy over the past seventy-five years, what's your overall assessment? Basically, China has always, in my knowledge, seen itself since 1949 as the leader of the developing world. It used a theory of equality called Marxism to create a stable government and. Mao gave China its sovereignty. Then Xiaoping said, "Communism can't mean poverty. We have to have socialism with Chinese characteristics, and we have to grow our economy. If we can't grow our economy, we're not going to be able to provide a stable government for our our people."、Mm-hmm. So that went along very well. Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao sort of. Then along came. A leader, another leader of genius, Xi Jinping, and said, "Well, we have to focus on eight major technological areas, and we can't just have our own success. We have to lead, going back to the roots of Chinese diplomacy.、Mm-hmm. We have to be a leader of the developing world. So we're going to have things like the Belt and Road and the AIIB." And、uh, BRICS and the New Development Bank,、uh, which is on the one hand, each of those policies is a stroke of genius for maintaining China's internal economic development, but also a stroke of genius in enabling its trading partners in the developing world to share its success. Mm, you mentioned that China intends to be the leader of the developing world, but. On the Chinese side, probably we don't have that, you know, thought in the first place. Maybe China just wants to set an example that a developing country can manage to do or accomplish all those things, right? But it's just turned out that we developed a little bit faster than other countries in that sense. Well,、um, in your opinion, what have been the most Significant diplomatic achievements or milestones of China during this period. Well, I was very impressed with、uh, Mao's ability to unite the country with a theory of equality.、Uh, I was extremely impressed in 1997 when I began thinking about China. The only statesman in the world that I found had a theory about how the future could, of mankind could work. Was、uh, Deng Xiaoping?、Mm-hmm. Deng Xiaoping said, "No, no, no. We're not going to have a nuclear war. Our problem is economic development." So nobody in 1978, China was in pretty bad shape. And none of the generals, basically,、uh, and leaders of the party, knew what to do with it. But even Mao had, in, had told Brezhnev that、uh, Deng Xiaoping would be the future leader of China.、Mm-hmm. There's a, f- a wonderful、uh, excerpt from Deng Xiaoping's third volume of selected works, w- where he's talking to the president of Hungary, and he's saying, "You know, there were a bunch of farmers, and they decided to do their collective farming, but also farm on privately on the side, and." The productivity went way up, so he Deng Xiaoping didn't really know how to solve the problem, but he took the generals down to see these farmers,、mm. and the generals realized, well, none of us know how to 
how to run an economy. Other than Cho and Lai and Deng Xiaoping, none of us have really been educated outside of China. Uh, they happened to be in a work uh, study program in France in 1917. So they bestowed on uh, Deng Xiaoping this, if any of us can figure it out, it's this guy, so we're, we're all going to support him. Mm. That sort of mindset change, the ability to, we care about people. Our country is poor. It's not going to have a stable government unless it can grow economically. How can we do that? Uh, so we're going to produce a leader of the quality of, of Deng Xiaoping who says, well, we're not going to get ready for the next nuclear war. We're basically going to focus on economic development. That is, genius is something that's obviously true, compelling, which no one ever thought of before. Mm. So we have that push. Now, China was always talking about, in those early years, the North-South divide. So that theme, in my view, has continued and the Belt and Road and AIIB is mm. basically the continuation of what used to be called, when I was in university, the North-South Divide. Right. Actually, how to improve people's livelihood is not just um, you know, what we did in, over the past few decades. That's what uh, the Chinese nation been um, dedicated or been seeking over the past um, 3,000 years. You mentioned this Belt and Road Initiative. I think recently on social media, there was this viral video featuring Daniel Rund, a senior vice president of the U.S. Center for Strategic and International Studies, who once commented on China's BRI. He said, quote unquote, BRI is an ambitious and hopeful project. I <laughs> hate it because it's a great idea because it inspires folks in the global south. It's just not our idea. So from being questioned to being um, accepted by more than 150 countries and being imitated, if you will, by the U.S. and its allies, the Belt and Road Initiative is regarded by some observers as the most ambitious and successful diplomatic effort China has made in the past decade. So from your perspective, what's the significance of this initiative when looking at it more than a decade after its launch? Again, I, I see it as a, a stroke of genius. Um, how do you continue your domestic econ economic growth? How do you expand your economic reach? So China produces a leader and he says, well, we're, we should have a Belt and Road project where we invest all this excess foreign capital we're, we're generating with our trade in developing the infrastructure in our trading partners, both in the developing world and the developed world. Mm. So it's a very, very wise and uh, noble policy. I think the, the realization, basically, that um, it's a very successful idea. The Western media likes to say, oh, it won't work, it's bad, but it speaks for itself. It is very successful. In terms of? Um... Well, the IMF and the Asian Development Bank uh, were not really providing the economic wherewithal for developing countries to have the infrastructure to develop. And if you don't have infrastructure, you don't develop. China, as a developing country itself, understands the critical importance of infrastructure and it's, it's using its success to fund uh, other countries' success. This is A Journey Through Time, a special series dedicated to the 75th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. But it's not like it's China who, who's been developing this project. Like the, the U.S. also got similar projects too, right? Why have the developing countries accepted the BRI instead of uh, those provided by the states and its allies? Well, the background, of course, is colonialism and racism. So the countries that benefited first from the Industrial Revolution, England and then America and other countries created colonies and China was a victim of that attempt to colonize China. And it w rejected that. 
the Americans did the Marshall Plan, which mm. is analogous to the Belt and Road, because they were <laughs> fighting the, the Russians and communism. But the developed world really wanted to keep the developing countries poor and to exploit them. So China basically, as a developing country, realizes it, it has to form, it is part of the South, it is part of the developing world. It just happens to be, as you said, the most successful of the developing countries because it has a very effective government. And the, the, West, the Europeans and the, and the Americans, there was a view basically, there was a thesis that in order to have economic development, you had to have capitalism. Now, in a capitalist country, like the United States, for example, capitalism controls politics and public policy. In China, uh, its political system, socialism, controls capitalism, public policy, and politics. And as a result of socialism controlling politics, public policy, and capitalism, in a single generation... China has gone from having a, a GDP of about a billion people with $278 billion uh, a year in 1978 to having uh, 14 or $15 trillion. No one in the world has ever produced so much economic growth in its size, speed, and global impact as this socialist government in China. So this is a new way of modernizing, and it ends the monopoly that the capitalist countries thought, oh, you have to basically let us own you if you're going to economically progress, and by the way, we're not going to let you economically progress. China's come along and said, no, well, we're a socialist country, and we've economically progressed, so we will invest in your success also, and we don't care what kind of a government you have, as long as you basically are wanting to develop. And so you're saying that the logic behind, you know, the two different uh, projects provided by two, I should say, countries are basically different. Yes. You know, there's a view, basically, that in order for me to win, you have to lose. The Chinese approach is, well, in order for me to win, you have to win. And that we call that socialism with Chinese characteristics. In the United States, according to recent studies by Harvard and Princeton, less than 1% of Americans control public policy and uh, politics. And the result is a very unstable society. In China, Harvard did a survey from 2000 to 2016 and were absolutely staggered. They found that the popular support for the Chinese government went from 86% in 2000 to 93% in 2016. And this basically, they were thinking, from the Western point of view, if China broke up into a series of provinces, mm -hmm. it could be easily dominated. So they're very much against the success of the Communist Party of China implying socialism with Chinese characteristics. Now, for me, what I found, I read a book 50 years ago in university that explained to me what's going on in China. Plato wrote a book called The Republic 2,300 years ago. Right. And he said, basically, if you want to have a society that's not always at war <laughs> internally and externally, you should pick a, a group of guardians, and they should be judged throughout their careers by their behavior and their commitment to the well-being of the society. So when I look at uh, the Communist Party of China, I, I call it the Guardian Party of China. And it has, in order to get anywhere where you're close to making high-level decisions in China, you have to have both... 38, 40 years of successful experience. And one of the reasons I like China is it, it has a government that is capable of successful long-term economic planning. And what isn't understood by most Chinese and by almost all foreigners 
is why the Chinese system of government works. And mm. in my opinion, it works because there are three continuous feedback loops from the bottom to the top, from the bottom to the top. Within the what I call China's Guardian Party, there are 96 million members, and it's constantly gathering information about what are the problems, what policies are working, what policies are needed. Then you have in the NPC another continuous feedback loop doing the same thing. And then in the CPPC, you have a third feedback loop. So these are perceived, the NPC and the CCPC are perceived by Westerners as simply rubber stamps for what the CPC is doing when, in my view, the success of the... How did China in a single generation hmm. create 800 million people out of poverty, 400 million of which into the middle class? It did this because of the successful feedback loops within these three organizations. So in my view, China has the most effective, most re representative and most responsible government that I'm aware of in the world. The IMF notes that nobody has alleviated poverty to the degree that the Chinese government has just in a single lifetime. Mm, you're saying that's most representative of the whole nation. You're saying that the CBC is the guardians of the country. But uh, when it comes to, you know, other developing countries, you know, the West is questioning whether they can be the guardian also of those developing countries. They're saying that China creates this uh, BRI and used it as a debt trap. So from your perspective, is it valid well, argument? Well... In any society, whether it's 330 million Americans or 1.4 billion Chinese, you have to have representatives. Mm. The problem is, how do you pick the representatives and how do you ensure that they are working for the interest of the people? Lincoln had this ideal of government of the people, by the people, and for the people. America, according to the Harvard and Princeton studies that I mentioned a minute ago, doesn't succeed in having... It, you, you can vote, but you're, it doesn't affect the public policy outcomes, which are determined, according to those studies, by less than 1% of Americans. So the whole idea that you could have a socialist government that lifted 800 million people out of poverty in one generation is terrifying to the developed nations. To the developing nations, it's inspiring. The issue about, well, is China creating a debt trap? Uh, I think that the IMF and the World Bank created debt traps, and that led to the Asian financial crisis. It was the Americans that produced the 2008 financial crisis. I don't see the same level of irresponsibility in the way China is investing globally. And I also see there have been studies which point out the stages that the BRI has gone through, the first stage, the second stage, the third stage. You have the expansion of BRICS. You have the AIIB you have the New Development Bank. The world is changing just in the last 10 years in a way that is inspiring to the developing, the 260 developing nations, absolutely terrifying to uh, America, many of the Western European countries, uh, Japan and Australia and New Zealand, because it's not, they're no longer able to dominate colonialism isn't working anymore. And in fact, their own systems of government are unstable. Mm -hmm. The Chinese system of government, Zalek, who was an undersecretary of the Treasury and went on to be head of the World Bank, commented about 15 years ago, the problem is it's hard to persuade the Chinese to stop doing what they're doing because it's working. 
Well, yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Government of China can be the guardians of the Chinese people, but why does it have to be the guardians of other countries? It's not. I don't think what China has accomplished is replicable in other countries. I think China leads by example. As I said, I see the developing world looking at China not as dominating it, but as inspiring it. I think, as I said, for the developed world, it's used to being, there's an old saying that uh, the rich, the, the powerful do what they want and the uh, weak suffer what they must. I'm asking um, whether China is trying to be or it can be the guardians of those countries by providing such a project as uh, the BRI. Well, it's doing two things. It's helping its own economy grow by making sure its neighbors' economies grow. That doesn't sound like a bad thing to me. China's joining or rejoining uh, those organizations, such as the World Trade Organization or the United Nations, were absolutely regarded as milestones in this country's um, diplomacy, right? What role has China played in shaping or reshaping, if you will, regional and global diplomatic norms and institutions? Well, I think it's it's... It's, again, Deng Xiaoping who realized that socialism can't mean everybody has got a per capita income of less than $300 a year. So he says we've got to open up. We need foreign investment. So he persuades the Americans, starting with Carter, culminating with Clinton, with a little help from Goldman Sachs along the way, to let China into the WTO. The WTO was really designed to, for the developed countries to exploit the developing countries. The Americans and the Europeans are quite upset because, you mean you make better cars than we do? This is dumping. We should be able to sell Porsches and Mercedes and Volkswagens in China. In fact, if we can't, we're out of business, our own domestic car companies. But you've come along with electronic vehicles help with climate change, this shocks us. So there's an adjustment process going on. As I said, China it has to cope with its own success, mm. and it has to help the people who are negatively affected by its success, like the Americans and the Europeans. The economic stability that they need, going back to Larry Summers' four questions, if you have America becoming half the size of the largest economy, how can America remain stable? China cannot achieve its own goals in 19, 2049 unless it also ensures that there is a stable global economy in 2050. So it used to be that China just had to worry about how to get China to grow. Now it has to do both. It has to help its trading partners grow. And that's where Belt and Road, AIIB, New Development Bank, and BRICS come in. However, those things upset the Americans and the European Union and the IMF and the World Bank uh, and the Asian Development Bank because China's doing a... It's better at funding economic development and its goals are are more broadly spread than the traditional World Bank IMF system. Mm. Well, let's turn to uh, Sino-U.S. relations, which is widely recognized the, the relationship occupies a significant portion of China's diplomatic efforts, obviously. How have China's diplomatic relations with the U.S. evolved over the past 75 years? And in your opinion, what's the most memorable chapter in the bilateral relations? Well, one of the big changes when I first began to look at U.S.-China relations seriously was the Chinese would talk to the Americans, Henry Paulson at Goldman Sachs or the Treasury Secretary, mm. and uh, the Chinese would say, we want a win-win relationship. And the Americans would say, great, providing it's a win for America economically and a win for America's military hegemony. Recently, John Thornton, who is sort of the leader of the current Council of Foreign Relations cadre of people, said the problem is now 
A uh, win-win means a win for China and a, a win for China. We can't compete with you guys anymore. And it's almost tragic. The generation of, of American elite China experts never foresaw China's success. They never foresaw the chaos that's going on that's weakening America. America's going through its own cultural revolution now. So the big changes in diplomacy are Deng Xiaoping realizing we're not going to have a nuclear war, we're going to economically develop. Xi Jinping realizing we have to basically share our success and we have to leapfrog from being the manufacturing plant of the world to leading in eight of the high-tech industries that are going to determine uh, economic power. And to the surprise, an Australian think tank recently realized that in 27 of 34 areas, the Chinese are way ahead, that there are, in fact, eight Silicon Valleys in China, not just one. So Chinese diplomacy has worked in the past. It's big challenge in the future, it has to now figure out a way to protect the economic stability of its biggest critics. I hope China focuses on what I call the new school of U.S.-China relations, which says, okay, how can China create uh, 12 million new jobs for Americans? What I call the old school of U.S.-China relations. Its goals are to preserve America's economic and military dominance. The occurrence of the global financial crisis, the failure of America in its wars, undermine the facts on which the old school goals are based. So the new school focuses on how to align the economic and national security of the two largest economies. Dr. John Milligan White, Executive Chairman of the America-China Partnership Foundation, talking to my colleague Tu Yun. That's all the time for this edition of the World Today. A quick recap of the headline news. China has allowed citizens of four more European countries to travel to China visa-free. Israel launches ground operations against Hezbollah. To listen to this episode again or to catch up on previous episodes, you can download our podcast by searching World Today. I'm Ding Han in Beijing. Thank you so much for listening. Bye for now.